The following program is brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novos Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovosOrdoWatch.org. program is presented by member-supported Restoration Radio. This program, along with all the rest, are made possible by our members, who enable us to produce truly Catholic content, as well as supporting the clergy who are vital to our work. We sincerely thank them for their support and would ask you to please remember them in your prayers. To access the rest of this series and to support our Catholic clergy, please consider becoming a member today. We'd also like to take this opportunity to announce the launch of our new Memento Mori line. As we enter into November and the end of the liturgical year, it is a fitting time for us to recall our own mortality and the four last things. Be sure to check out these products in the shelf below this video, and we hope that these items might serve as a reminder as you go about your day to remember thine own end. And now to our host. I'm your host, Stephen Heiner, and on this episode, I'm joined by His Excellency Bishop Donald Sanborn, Rector of Most Holy Trinity Seminary in Brooksville, Florida. Your Excellency, welcome. Oh, thank you. Nice to be here. His Excellency, today we'll be spending time on Libertas Prestantissimum by Pope Leo XIII. For those of you who are following along in the text, The Popes Against Modern Errors by Tan, you'll notice that we're skipping Humanum Genus. This is not a necessarily a permanent skip, but given that we've done a Root of the Rot episode on Freemasonry, we've done a history show on Freemasonry, and we also did uh, another episode last season on the flagship uh, about Freemasonry, we are going to skip past this in school for now because we feel in the last six months our listeners have heard a lot about this subject. So it isn't that it's not pertinent, it's not that we're, we don't consider it important, it's simply within the context of our network, which is why we're moving on to Libertas. I was speaking with His Excellency before today's episode began, and we, we were considering the, the length of this encyclical. If we look at the ones that we've covered up till now, Diaturnum Illud, or Mirari Vos, or, or even Quanta Cuda, we, we don't have the length, nor necessarily the philosophical explication that Libertas presents us with, and it's a good warm-up for the big encyclicals that we'll be working on later this season to include Rerum Novarum and Pascendi, which are going to need more than one episode. So His Excellency and I are going to do our best to try to get in as much as we can, and if needs be, we'll, we'll have a part two to this. Your Excellency, as I, as I was prepping for the show and, and, and rereading Libertas, it's been a while, uh, it struck me how much like a seminary class <laughs> the first uh, few paragraphs are, where you're having to define terms and walk through a certain set of assumptions. Uh, so I, I feel this is probably something you feel quite at home uh, going through. Absolutely. I, I've caught, taught this course many times. It, it just uh, Leo the Thirteenth was a great uh, devotee of St. Thomas, and I can see St. Thomas practically wrote this. <laughs> All of the things are, are classic Thomistic philosophy, moral philosophy. And uh, uh, so, yes, and he, of course, he did a beautiful job. So, yes, these are very familiar topics to me. So, well, let's start at the beginning, Eric. Let's see, paragraph one and paragraph two. Paragraph one, giving us the proper definition of liberty, and paragraph two, explaining why modern liberty doesn't really line up with that. Yes, well, the liberty is a, a quality of the human will uh, whereby we are able to elect the means to an end, but where the end remains the same. See, so uh, the, uh, if I, for example, want an ice cream cone, uh, I am free with regard to how I will go about obtaining the ice cream cone. Uh, 
so liberty, the, the object of free will, is the, uh, the means toward an end. Now, you might say, well, you're free or not to accept the ice cream cone. Yes, that's true. Uh, and uh, the, the point is that the ultimate end of man is God and the vision of God and the law of God. And therefore, though that remains always fixed. And the uh, liberty regards uh, the means to that end. So, for example, we must all glorify God by the uh, state of life in which we are in. And some might choose religious life, some might choose the married state, some might choose to be single. But the end always remains the same. There is always a fixed end with regard to liberty. So the, the, the first thing to understand is that liberty regards the means to an end in those cases where there are many different means to the same end. So I can go to various ice cream stores or, or uh, I can choose various states in life in order to please God. But in all cases, God must be pleased. That remains fixed. Uh, it is uh, the, the will is a faculty that is made to embrace the good to go toward the good and to be one with the good. That can never change, and that is not free. Human beings are fixed upon the good, and so ultimately they're fixed upon God. Uh, it is impossible. Even if uh, I decide I want to kill myself, I'm, uh, I'm, doing, I'm choosing that as a good. That is, as something that will alleviate, supposedly, my problems. So even when we elect something that is terrible, <clears throat> objectively, we are electing it because of some good in it, something about it that will accomplish a good for us, uh, because the will is fixed absolutely on the good and cannot extricate itself from the good. So no matter what it wills, it wills the good. And so the liberty concerns the means toward that ultimate good. Uh, that's the first thing to understand. So uh, uh, the false notion of liberty is the ability to, to choose between good and evil. Right? Uh, that is uh, uh, the ability to choose between good and evil is a defect of liberty. The fact that you can choose an evil thing is a defect of liberty. Uh, the, uh, the purpose, for example, of steering on your automobile is to achieve the end, to go to the places that you want to go. Now, you are able to drive your car into a ditch, but that you would never enter into the definition of steering. The ability to drive into a ditch, or no, no car company would ever advertise the fact that with this car you can drive into a ditch. <laughs> See, the, it's an imperfection. Uh, it's, be, it's due to the fact that we, uh, uh, our, our intellects are, are weak and our wills are weak and, and therefore can, can go off the cliff. Uh, so if people, for example, are texting, they often drive off the cliff or they drive into a ditch. Or, or worse, they, they drive into the next lane and have terrible accidents. Uh, and that's because the, the, they are not keeping their attention on the end. See, if they had their eyes on the road, they would, they would be fine. But they're not keeping their attention on the end. So also, human beings are capable of defecting from their attention upon the end. So is it proper to say, or so see, that this defect did not exist prior to the fall? Uh, it, it, uh, or it only existed correct. in potency? Uh, well, the, well, let me explain something. In in itself, as if you take man in pure nature, what we call pure nature, which never existed, uh, he would still have that defect. But because okay. God gave him, uh, uh, well, let me see, the, 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 back up. The first parents were capable of sinning. Uh, the, they did not have the special grace that only the Blessed Virgin Mary had of never sinning. No one, according to the opinion of theologians, 
ever had that except the Blessed Virgin Mary. She never committed a single sin, even a venial sin. All other people were subject at least to venial sin. Uh, and so were the first parents. They were subject to sin. That was the whole idea of the test that they had, was that they were capable of that defect, and that they had to show God that they loved him above all things and merited heaven, and there they would be impeccable. The reason why you are impeccable in heaven, that is, unable to commit a sin, is because the good, as it is good, now the perfect good is in front of you, and it is impossible for your will to take itself away from it, because it completely fulfills the will and you desire nothing else, because it is the perfect good. The will is made for the good, so if it is in front of the perfect good, it adheres to the perfect good necessarily, just as your eyes are made for light and color. When you open your eyes, you necessarily see light. You can't refuse to see the light. <laughs> you can't say, my eyes are open, the sun is out, but I refuse to look at it. You cannot, mm -hmm. because your eyes are in front of their what we call their proper object, and necessarily you must see. Uh, so also, when the will is in front of its proper object, that is the ultimate good, which is God, it must adhere. And so you become impeccable, that is, unable to sin, because you are locked into the, uh, into the good. So the first parents were able to sin, but they had the preternatural gifts, which made them uh, not subject to the common weaknesses that we have. Uh, they were not subject to concupiscence, and, and, and uh, their, their emotions were completely in control of their will, and uh, there, there was no disorder in them. So their sin could only have been a very intellectual sin, and it was a sin of disobedience. A lot of the rationalists make fun of, the, of what happened in the Garden of Paradise. You know, how could anybody believe this? You know? But it, actually, it's quite in conformity with all of what we know about human beings, uh, the, that uh, if, if, uh, if their emotions were under control uh, by the preternatural gifts, the only sin that they could have committed was, would, would have been a very deliberate act of, of rebellion against God, uh, of, a, of a pride, uh, a purely intellectual sin in which they would have seen by, their, by the depth of their intelligence, also from the preternatural gifts, the effects. In other words, they were not dragged into something uh, of which they did not see the effect. They wanted what the devil was offering them. They were very deliberate about their rebellion against God. They wanted to have the rights of God. That's what the, the devil was tempting them with. So it, it really fits into all of the philosophy that we know about human beings. Uh, you know, they were incapable of sin of concupiscence or sin of anger. Incapable of it. So in that sense, they were very much protected, but... They were not impeccable by any means, as we know. Fair <laughs> well, fair enough, Eric. I, I suppose my question was, can we say that up to the point of the fall, they were experiencing what we would know and as you have defined as true liberty, which is they could choose multiple paths. They could, they could you know, ha talk to these animals, not talk to these animals, but spend time with these animals, walk in this part of the garden. They, they had lots of different choices that choosing for, to eat from that tree introduced the concept of choosing between good or evil. And, and prior to that time, not to say that they, they couldn't have, but that up, uh, up to that point, they have, were only choosing between possible goods. Yes, uh, choosing between uh, among goods that in, uh, all, which all lead to the same end. You know, there's, there's many paths to grandma's house. <laughs> so, you know, if I propose to drive from Florida to New York, there's various ways that I can do it. They all lead to the same end. And so I, I, can, I have a freedom of choice concerning that because I, I keep the end always intact. And uh, so that's, that's the true notion of liberty. It presupposes the end. 
And actually, the more distant the end, the more you are free. And I'll explain that. The, the more you are attached to God, the more you are free with regard to material things, because those things really mean nothing to you. For example, the martyrs, uh, you know, if, if an emperor says, I'll throw you into a, a, a brass bull, which was one of the things that Decius figured out, uh, he, he tried to think up tortures for the martyrs, I'll throw you into the belly of a brass bull and light a fire under it, and you'll just bake in there. See, because they are so attached to God, they don't care. See, they are not in any way, uh, their, their liberty is not in any way compromised. They don't care. Go ahead and do it See, because they are attached to God. So the more you are attached to God, the more you become free with regard to any other lesser good because you are you see it only in the light of, of attaining God and possessing God. So whether it is there or not, you don't care. So, for example, a great man like St. Louis, King of France, he was surrounded by riches but because he was a great saint. He didn't care whether they were there or not. Mm. <laughs> see that so the the more your ultimate end is is distant from you namely god the more you are free with regard to things of this world uh conversely the more you uh are attached to the things of this world the less free you are you see if i put uh, uh food down in front of my cat the only thing that cat can do is eat it because he's necessitated to it and likewise, if I'm addicted to concupiscence or some other sin, put that concupiscence in front of me, and practically the only thing I can do is go after it because of that attachment. See, so I become a slave to material things and a slave to goods which are very close to me. Now, See, I've yes, taught this yeah. course, you can tell, right? <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, and I've heard I've heard Grandma's house in, in in more than one sermon before, so I know it's it's a well trodden road. But I don't want to. Well, I've been get... ordained for forty years, so <laughs> I have all of these stock examples. <laughs> and, and 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 I think they work well, Your Excellency. And I don't want to get too uh, off into the tall grass on my way to Grandma's house. But I think if we if we understand if we get the foundation of it, I think the rest of this encyclical will will go really well for our listeners. So I'm going to mm -hmm. permit just a, a, a digression here, or maybe a, a simple lateral move. How is liberty different for angels compared to man? Well, the uh, they remain free. The angels have the beatific vision. They remain completely free. Uh, in, in the sense that they are still uh, free with regard to anything created. Uh, they don't lose their liberty because their uh, will is fixed on God. Far from it. They become more free with regard to anything created. They are totally indifferent toward it uh, because uh, they are fixed on God. So if it, if it doesn't pertain to God, they have no use for it. Uh, if it is against God, they hate it, uh, and with a with a terrible hatred. Uh, so they are free uh, with regard to every every creature, because they are attached to God. The more you are attached to God, the more free you are with regard to anything created, and that's true of the saints. Anybody who has the beatific vision, uh, God Himself is ultimately and perfectly free because He is His own end. See, so He doesn't need anything or have to do anything or desire anything. He has no end to achieve or to attain. I don't know if this makes sense to you. No, it does. It does. And I I wanted to I wanted to tie that into paragraphs three and four. And again, I want to encourage our listeners, this is maybe the, the most philosophical encyclical that we've read so far this season. So I just want to encourage you to stick with it and I will try to highlight some passages from the encyclical so you don't feel too lost. And, and one of them is here in, in paragraph three. Uh, His, His Holiness says, but man can judge of this contingency, as we say, only because he has a soul that is simple, spiritual, and intellectual. And then he goes on in paragraph four to say, as the Catholic Church declares in the strongest terms, the simplicity, spirituality, and immortality of the soul. So we're, we define liberty. Can you... 
can you parse that for us, Your Excellency? What do we mean when we say that, that the soul has characteristics of simplicity, spirituality, and immortality? Well, simplicity, because it's not composed of body, it has no parts in it. It's just a simple spiritual thing. Uh, spirituality, because it, it has, again, no body. And immortality, because it has nothing to corrupt it. Because the essential activity of the soul is something immaterial, that is, to know the truth and to embrace the good. And therefore, it, it has immortality, and this we know even by reason, because its essential acts are spiritual. And what is spiritual has no principle of corruption. The reason why you die is because your body corrupts. That is, little by little, and let me tell you, I'm 65. So little by little, it starts to fall apart, just like a car. And, and, but your soul remains the same, so you feel the same as you were when you're you know, 21. But your body is falling apart, and it is on a gradual process toward death. That is when when the final uh, you know, when things fall apart to such an extent that it can no longer sustain the soul. That the the body becomes so uh, corrupt that the soul finds it as something it can no longer inhabit. Because body and soul, the the, the flesh must be in good enough condition to sustain the soul as, as a single thing. In other words, body and soul resulting in a single thing, uh, a man. And so when, it's like when the house, you know, loses its roof and everything's leaking, and it's time to move out. So <laughs> the soul decides this is, you know, I'm, I'm being sort of well, slightly... Unfortunately, and I was going to say, unfortunately, we don't have another house to move into at that point, right? We just, we just have, <laughs> well, we just we have do. the one that we were issued. Well. <laughs> right. Well, this, this, we're going to some house after that. Uh, <laughs> but we know from Bergoglio that there's no hell. And I'm sure Bur- purgatory has bitten the dust a long time ago, so everyone goes to heaven, So, <laughs> according to Bergoglio. But he might find out otherwise you know, when, when his body breaks down. But in any case, that's what happens. The soul has immortality because it has no principle of corruption. See, the body has a principle of corruption because it is composed of many disparate elements. And those, those disparate elements try to separate one from another. That's why your body breaks down. And the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the soul does its best, so to speak, to keep things together by all of the processes. But in time, it all breaks down. And, uh, and then the, that's why you die. Uh, something happens, you know, there's a stroke or a heart attack, whereby the, the body just goes into corruption and the soul has to depart. Uh, so, but the soul has no principle of corruption in it, so it goes on and on and on. Whether it goes to heaven, whether it goes to purgatory, whether it well, goes to hell. Unless you're annihilated, of course. Which, which unless you're annihilated, the, yes. You're annihilated easy, now. Easy, easy way out, for sure. <laughs> yes. Now, here he's always, he's always criticizing the mafia, there's no better thing that you could tell the mafia than they're going to be annihilated when they die. You know. Yeah, that's the best case scenario for them. Best case it scenario. Is. That's it is. You know, then rob some more people. You know. <laughs> well, so uh, but we in have... any case, uh, we don't. This is not the time to talk about Bergoglio, but uh, uh, that, that's the reason. And, and so he's saying that the liberty is based on the the spirituality of the soul because. The soul has two spiritual faculties, the intellect and the will. The intellect is made to know truth. The will is made to embrace the good. And uh, so those are, are, uh, that's the basis of our liberty, is that the intellect can see the relationship between what you want and the ultimate good. And whereas, see, if I put the food down in front of the cat, he knows he wants that food, but he doesn't see the relationship of what that food is to him. So whereas if I put down you know, a hamburger in front of you on Friday, you say, I can't eat this. I mean, I'm starved, but I won't eat this because it is against the law of the church to eat this, and therefore I would ruin my, uh, my attachment to the ultimate good if I eat that. So whereas on Thursday the hamburger is good, on Friday the hamburger is bad. <laughs> and and 
because we see the connection, and that is because of our intellects. And therefore, our intellect shows the will what is good, what is bad. That is, what is in connection with the ultimate end, what is not. And the will is blind, and whatever it gets from the intellect, it takes. Uh, I compare it to a an aircraft flying in the soup, like gl- gray clouds, you know, overcast. They are relying entirely upon instruments. And so the will is relying entirely upon what the intellect is feeding it. Now, if the tower tells the plane <laughs> the wrong stuff, you know it's going to happen. You know, you're going to end up in the drink or, or worse. Uh, and... Uh, So also, the intellect can be deceived through the imperfection of the intellect, can be deceived and feed the the will a bad, something which is objectively bad, but under the aspect of good. So, for example, a sin of impurity, the intellect, of course, knows that it's wrong, but there is something good about it, that is, there's some pleasure about it, and therefore communicates to the will, this ought to be done. And the will accepts it as a good, because the intellect says so. That is the structure of a sin. But the will is a blind faculty. It does not judge concerning good and evil. The intellect does. And the intellect makes that judgment based on the relationship of what you want to the ultimate good. And uh, so it depends on what your notion of the ultimate good is. is if, If you say, well, the ultimate good is to have as much pleasure as possible in this world then all of the concupiscible things become good. See, but if your ultimate if you place God and the law of God as your ultimate good, then you are uh obviously going to avoid those things. Uh so uh that that's 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 what we would term the hardened sinner, somebody who has totally given up any idea of obeying the law of God and who is totally given over to uh created goods uh that are f- false because they do not uh are, they are not uh, in the conformity with the law of god but they do have some aspect of good uh the the will cannot embrace anything that is totally evil it has to have some aspect of good it responds to nothing but the good it is made for the good so that's why uh, you know people <laughs> our very notion of what is good and what is bad you know, what the political conservative might consider good, the liberal considers bad, and vice versa, uh, because of what the end is, what the end is to be achieved. Uh, it all depends on the end. That You cannot even think about the good without the end. Well, I think that His Holiness sums up uh, your point very well in at the end of paragraph 5 and getting into paragraph 6. So the end of the paragraph 5 ends with, The end or object, both of the rational will and of its liberty, is that good only which is in conformity with reason. And then that that thought continues in paragraph 6. Since, however, both these faculties are imperfect, it is possible, as is often seen, that the reason should propose something which is not really good, but which has the appearance of good, and that the will should choose accordingly. It goes on in the middle of the paragraph. And this implies, obviously, that the possibility of sinning is not freedom, but slavery. And Mm -hmm. the beginning of paragraph 7, such then being the condition of human liberty, it necessarily stands in need of light and strength to direct its actions to good and to restrain them from evil. So Mm -hmm. the Holy Father has, has walked us through from the beginning. What is liberty? What is false liberty? What assists liberty, as you say, reason and our intellect? And... Of course, it makes sense that you can choose something ill, so you need a guide for that. And, yes. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what, obviously, the Church is here for. Uh, even right reason, because even if God had never revealed a religion, even right reason would tell you the natural law, which, as he says in this encyclical, is simply the eternal law as it is planted in man's mind. And, and which can never be erased even by immorality. Uh, so, that, that, so even natural reason, but also, and, and more importantly, the Church, because uh, history proves that even the greatest philosophers could not figure out in its entirety 
the natural law, and they erred very, very seriously in many things. And and therefore, humanity descended, even among the Greeks and Romans, uh, into terrible barbarity, uh, uh, because it, it only knew a little bit of the natural law. And God, in his mercy, sent his only begotten Son to reveal to us the entirety of truth, and to give us the spirit of truth, and, and, and a church to guide us. And that's why civilization always follows the Catholic Church. Uh, all of the the beauty of European civilization is a product of the Catholic Church. Uh, I always say that after the French Revolution, where the, Europe threw off the Catholic Church, uh, there's really not that much to say. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I think New York is more interesting than <laughs> what there is to see in Europe after the French Revolution. I mean, when you think about some of the monuments... That, that awful Eiffel Tower, for example, should be torn <laughs> down. I mean, it's a monstrosity in, in that beautiful city. Uh, it's a monstrosity. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and the French think it is, too, by the way. They, they can't stand it. Oh, yeah, that, uh, that, that, it was that, supposed that, to be temporary. Well, there's a, yeah, there's a long, long story behind that. Uh, I, it's true, you <laughs> Any Anything that is of worth, I, I even point out all, all the treasures of French cooking – all of the rules for it were fixed prior to the revolution. So whatever we've seen, you know, those like to, uh, if I, I, I run into acquaintances who, who like to talk up the virtues of republicanism, small r, I always ask them what, what good, true, and beautiful has happened in France since 1789. And um, they're, usually, they're usually stuck at that point. So. Uh, th- I mean, there's a few you know things uh, you know are not too bad you know, but would you spend a, a, an expensive airfare to go over and see them? No. What what you're seeing in Europe is the effect of centuries of Catholicism. And and again, as I always say, go to the Protestant countries uh, that were always Protestant, like Holland, and, and in a certain cases, I mean, as far as their culture, the Scandinavian countries, I mean, does anyone go there? <laughs> what What is there to see? Well, there's I mean, they might, in Holland, tiles. you have a museum, but, <laughs> but you know, windmills, and there, there is no culture. Nothing comes out of Protestantism, whereas Catholicism produced magnificent, culture and and you couldn't if you spent your whole lifetime going around seeing all the paintings all the museums all of the other forms of art uh you know i don't know if you could actually accomplish it uh there's an incredible wealth of culture not only in in pictorial art and and but music and and just general habits and manners uh so that that's i mean that we're a little bit uh, off the subject but the civilization uh, follows Catholicism. Well, and as you said and so earlier, that, yes, the church. We need the church to direct our wills. That's that's, that's where we. But are. even if we didn't, as you point out, it's within the natural law. And His Holiness comments on this in the middle of paragraph nine. The precepts, therefore, of the natural law contained bodily in the laws of men have not merely the force of human law, but they possess that higher and more august sanction which belongs to the law of nature and the eternal law. Mm-hmm. Yes, that the that it is as Saint Paul says, it's written in the hearts of men, and Saint Paul blames the pagans for violating the natural law. They should have known better. Uh, so it, it is uh, now. It is true that certain what we call secondary uh, uh, secondary laws of the natural law are are the object of human ignorance, or could be the object of human ignorance but not the, what we call the primary laws of the natural law, that we must uh, do good and avoid evil, uh, that we must do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Uh, the the basic laws uh, are are always available to human beings. And the term for that is synderesis, the knowledge of uh, of the basic moral laws. Just as it is impossible for the intellect to abandon what we call the first principles of reason, uh, that something, the first principle of reason is something cannot be and not be at the same time. The intellect cannot abandon that. 
you can't say that uh, the animal in the field is a cow and at the same time not a cow because we are bound to that just as we are bound ultimately to God who is who he is. He is not something else. So therefore all truth is bound up in that identity of God with himself. I know this is getting a little bit high, but uh, the, the intellect is bound to that principle and the will is bound to the first principles of natural law and eternal law. And we cannot escape them. So the will cannot, as I said, adhere to anything that is perceived as evil. And uh, it can only per- adhere to something which is, which is perceived as good, in some way good, a good to be attained. Uh, and and so we are bound to those things. Well, and and it, and it's a li- it's a lifelong task, obviously. And and His Holiness proposes that obviously the Church helps us in this continuous process. And in paragraph twelve, he says, as to morals, the laws of the gospel not only immeasurably surpass the wisdom of the heathen, but are an invitation and an introduction to a state of holiness unknown to the ancients, and bringing man nearer to God. They make him at once the possessor of a more perfect liberty. I notice that when I read some of these modern business writings, they'll often go back to the Stoics as a, a touchstone. If, if you're outside of, of Christian teaching, you'll go to you know Seneca or Cicero, and and because for 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 people without religion, this is their their these are their saints. Uh, and the yes. Holiness makes the point here. This this state of holiness that that is available to us now was unknown to the ancients. It wasn't even within mm-hmm. their comprehension. And these were the, mm-hmm. the the brightest minds and those following all of the all the precepts of the natural law as much as they could. Let's say they 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 weren't they missed able to quite a few. Believe me, <laughs> indeed, <laughs> they missed quite a few, but they did their best, uh, and that that is a sign to human beings that. In what concerns their their greatest, uh, what is of greatest importance to them, they are very weak in. The what we should do, what laws govern us, uh, what is truth, what are the ultimate truths. Human beings have fallen on their faces in trying to discover those things. Uh, the best of the pagan world could only come up with a few of them. And that is the, the that, that demands the, the that, that is the reason why revelation is what we call morally necessary. That is, that if God wants to draw us out of that ignorance, uh, he it was necessary for him to reveal himself. Uh, there, there's also another great uh, sentence in that paragraph 12. He says, "So powerful, so conspicuous in this respect is the influence of the church." that experience abundantly testifies how savage customs are no longer possible in any land where she has once set her foot, but that gentleness speedily takes the place of cruelty, and the light of truth quickly dispels the darkness of barbarism. And that is very true. Very, very true. Well, you don't have to go any further than your continent, uh, Your Excellency, and uh, imagine uh, a Mexico in which 13-year-old virgins had their hearts ripped out, before Our Lady of Guadalupe came to subdue that uh, that part of the world. Yes, and you know now that Mexico Mexico turned its back on Catholicism in the 19th century, just as everybody else did, and and especially in the 1920s, uh, and you see the barbarism returns, uh, and uh, the, you know what's what's going on there, and and. Uh, uh, other, other, uh, just uh, for example, all of the relish, even in movies, of of violence. Uh, and I'm not one of these people that's against uh, John Wayne shooting, a, a, you know, some criminal. But the <laughs> the uh, relish of violence, where people want to see, uh, you know, blood and guts in a, in a really weird way that you see in movies, uh, that, that is a return of barbarism. It's the beginnings of it. Uh, that's what brought on the, the uh, gladiatorial games. You know, to watch somebody get killed, uh, whoa, or, or watch the tortures of the martyrs, and, oh, boy, that, that's, look at that, that's really good. See, that is barbaric. And that was in the Roman Empire, which was in many other ways civilized, especially with regard to law. 
So uh, human beings may achieve through their natural powers certain virtues, but they cannot achieve their own, achieve their own perfection. Those are the, the, the total perf- natural perfection. It's impossible. They fall down on their face. They commit mortal sins. They fall into savagery and barbarism. We want to remind you that you are listening to Popes Against the Modern Errors on the Restoration Radio Network. I'm your host, Stephen Heiner. And today, with His Excellency Bishop Donald Sanborn, we've been discussing the nature of true liberty, what the world proposes as false liberty, the fact that liberty is assisted by both uh, the will and the intellect, and that we obviously have the ability to choose ill, and uh, uh, in addition to the natural law, uh, as a guide, we also have the church. In the modern age, this has been denied, and if you go to paragraph 16, you'll see that His Holiness outlines what happens as a result of this denial. He starts by pointing out that the natural world would pro- the natural world, the modern world would propose that pleasure is the measure of what is lawful. With reference also to public affairs, authority is severed from the true and natural principle whence it derives all its efficacy for the common good, and the law determining what is right to do and avoid doing is at the mercy of a majority. Now, this is simply a road leading straight to tyranny. The empire of God over man and civil society once repudiated, it follows that religion, as a public institution, can have no claim to exist, and that everything that belongs to religion will be treated with complete indifference. And we've seen this fulfilled to the letter, Your Excellency. Absolutely. He's uh, uh, said so beautifully. Uh, his encyclicals are really great. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the modern notion of liberty is based on ultimately the Reformation. <clears throat> liberty of thought is the basis of all modern notion of liberty. That there is no constraint upon what I think that I am completely my own man on what I think is true. That that is the basis of all of it. That flows over into uh, the uh, uh, liberty of activity, that whatever I think is right and good, I can do. And nobody has the right to in any way contradict me. I should be able to do whatever I want. Because I, because freedom of thought says whatever you think is good should be done. So that there's no control over the intellect, no law governing the intellect, and there's no law governing the will in, in the pursuit of the good. Now, there's the practical problem. Well, how does everybody get along if everyone's doing what they want? Well, they say, this is Rousseau. Well, then you have to go by the majority of the people. See, then the, the majority of the people will decide what is good, what is bad. And if you accept the majority opinion, you are, then you know that you are doing what is right. That's Rousseau. A certain infallibility of the people. That the general will, as he called it, is, is the... Uh, everyone enjoys freedom by being part of this mass of humanity that is exercising its freedom. So you're free, even if you disagree with what the, ma- what the, what the general will wants, because that's the general will. You are participating in this sort of massive freedom of the, of the people. This is Rousseau. I mean, I'm not kidding you about this or making this up. All right, so what that causes in the political order is a completely democratized state in the sense that you have a, a government that is um, created by people, this mass of people, uh, with, that has it, it derives its power from the mass of people and must conform its laws to the majority of this mass of people and which can be thrown out by the same mass of people, it's usually known as a mob, uh, and, uh, and which generates politicians who simply uh, listen to the, the, the general will and change themselves accordingly, who are really not much different from a robot or, or some other programmable machine. 
so they become, you know, they have no adherence to objective truth, but they have adherence only to what they're hearing. So we, we see in our own country, you know, politicians that, that change like chameleons and promise one thing and deliver something else because people change. And uh, so that, that's the, uh, and of course, religion uh, plays no part in that because human beings are completely free. They're completely free to accept religion or not. And uh, the uh, God, religion is a private affair. Uh, religion doesn't even have the right to tell you what to think or do. That all goes back to the Reformation, to pick up the Bible and decide for yourself what the Bible says and repudiate the, the authority of the Church. So it all goes back to that, and it creates a... Uh, a it demands the form of government of democracy, as he mentions in, in this encyclical. It demands democracy... Uh, in this sense, power to the people, that the people are the the proprietors of political power. Uh, political power derives not from God, but from the people, and that they are always in possession of the power of revolution. Uh, Jefferson said that, that the, the people always have a right of revolution. It's in the Declaration of Independence that when you decide, when this mass of people decides that, that the, you know, the government is no longer any good, it can throw it out and have a, an uprising, an insurrection. And uh, that, that has been politics since, the, well, since 1776. I mean, those ideas were fleshed out in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution, and then they, they became spread all over Europe by the French Revolution and Napoleon. And this is the world in which we live. And we are astonished as we see uh, in our own country basic morality being thrown out the window by law uh, when, it sh when it should be protected by law. And the reason is that there's nothing to appeal to except what the general populace wants. There is no law to appeal to. Whatever that general will is, that's it. So you see these Republicans, for example, who were very staunch on homosexual marriages a few years ago, now they're reaching out. I mean, even uh, Santorum, uh, who was uh, Mr. Social Conservative five or six years ago, now is, is reaching out to the gays and, and, and uh, being very soft about all of that stuff. Uh, and uh, uh, Rubio was reaching out and, and you know, all these supposed conservatives. Why? Because Bergoglio has changed the whole... Uh, those are Both of them are Novus Ordo Catholics, and Bergoglio has changed the, the field on that, that, that uh, you know, the, that, uh, this sort of violation of the natural law is not so bad after all, and that this is not a disorder, and that this is uh, something that, that society can accept. So they are just going along with this popular flow, this mob flow. And you know, that points to some very serious problems down the line. Even Justice Kennedy, you know, who's by no means a you know, social conservative, he said in regard to what's being put in front of the Supreme Court now, he said, well, if, you, if we uh, approve of, of this um, homosexual marriage, what stops us from approving of polygamy? Why not? With all of the principles that you're putting forth to us, he's saying this to the lawyers. How does why would we not then approve of polygamy? And of course, you know, there's a whole bunch of other things you could say after that. Hmm. Uh, you know, that a man has a, a lot of wives, a, a woman has a lot of uh, husbands, and you know, with with homosexual marriage, a man has a lot of husbands, a woman has a lot of wives. <laughs> Until it's just sick. I mean, the whole thing is just sick and weird. Uh, but at least he saw that. <laughs> mm, indeed. But there's nothing for them to appeal to. They can't say, well, our Constitution is based on the natural law, or our Constitution is based on Revelation, or even the Holy Bible, or anything. There's a bunch of people in, in, in Washington in black robes who decide these things that pertain to eternal salvation, and the morality of human beings. I mean, who are they? Who, who has anointed them to do that? Well, what is and, their expertise? And, 
and, and, and His Holiness puts his finger on, on that exact point. In the middle of paragraph 17, he says, Indeed, if the human mind be so presumptuous as to define the nature and extent of God's rights and its own duties, reverence for the divine law will be apparent rather than real, and arbitrary judgment will prevail over the authority and providence of God. Yes, that's exactly that par- it. That paragraph ends by saying, These laws it is that embody the government of God, who graciously guides and directs the intellect and the will of man, lest these fall into error. Let then that continue to remain in a holy and inviolable union, which neither can nor should be separated and in all things, for this is the dictate of right reason itself, let God be dutifully and obediently served. So the French Revolution essentially made out of society and government uh, like a mad dog off the leash. That, that's essentially what we have, and, and there's nothing to stop it from going down the drain. Nothing at all. No obstacle at all to stop it from going down the drain. He then goes on in paragraph 19 to put forth a fear uh, and a concern which we have seen fulfilled in our day, which is the principle that every man is free to profess, as he may choose, any religion or none. And this encyclical was written in 1888, you can see, when this was still a battle that was raging, and it was not necessarily, this principle was not taken for granted. Whereas if you and I were to have a conversation, and I'm sure you've seen this yourself, you would have a conversation, this is of course gospel truth, the inversion of the gospel obviously, that, well of course it is a fundamental human right that you may you may profess or practice or pursue any any religion that you'd like. Everyone should be guaranteed that right. This is this is where we are. Yes, it goes back again to what I said, that freedom of thought that goes back to the Reformation. Uh free examination of the scriptures, freedom of thought. Uh that uh because religion regards something that is Uh, as the liberals would see it, entirely personal, and it regards thought, it regards dogmas and and things that we think. Uh, Therefore, it is beyond the domain of anyone's, including the state or or anyone's reach, and therefore pertains to a freedom that is absolutely inviolable because it it, it is part of the fundamental freedom of thought that the state cannot reach into our minds and tell us what to think, and and no one else can reach into our minds and tell us what to think. People may suggest to us, and we can consider their suggestions, but no one can uh, can in any way constrain us uh, to to or, or tell us that something is true, something is false. Now, you know, the the response to that is the human intellect, like everything else, is ordered to God and it's ordered to the truth. And it has a freedom only to embrace the truth. It, it, is not, it does not have a, a freedom in the sense of a legitimate choice to, to embrace falsehood. Uh, it is made for, for the truth. So therefore, it must adhere to the truth. If God has revealed a religion, then it must adhere to the revealed religion, obviously. So the freedom of, of religion... Uh, is actually a repudiation of the Church's divine foundation and mission. That it it really has no mission from God. It was not founded by God. It is not the true religion, because if you were to admit all of those things, obviously you would have to join it. You would have to profess it. Under pain of sin. Under pain of hell. Now, Bergoglio says there's no hell. But the the, uh, under pain of hell... You would have to adhere to it, and this has you know, this was true in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a history of Israel's infidelity to the true faith, and their subsequent punishment and their subsequent uh, repentance. But the prophets and and Moses, I mean, if you read one, it, it's constantly uh, they they are constantly berating the Jews for not being faithful to their own law, the true faith at that time. And and so it, the the necessity to adhere to the true faith is of course in, a, in accordance with right reason, and it is in accordance with the law of God. And, and infidelity was very severely punished by God, very severely punished by God, because it, it strikes at at our at our 
deepest obligation to him, which is to believe what he says. Uh, so that, that freedom of thought is the basis for freedom of religion. That you know, you cannot touch me. Now, on the other hand, the church has never been in favor of conversion by the sword, and it has always. Uh, insisted that any conversion to the Catholic faith be in a free atmosphere, that is, where there's, there's no uh, threat of violence or, or of misery, uh, that, that it uh, has to be embraced freely. But that has nothing to do with an intrinsic right to embrace falsehood, which is defended by liberalism. You have the obligation to uh, adhere to the truth, but the Church recognizes that you must have the truth sufficiently presented to you before you could make a reasonable act of of accepting it. Now, it's obvious. And uh, the Church always condemned that. I mean, if anyone ever did it, it was not with the approval of the Church. Because the Church always condemned that idea. And there are some who would like to exonerate Vatican II by saying, oh, it's just the Church saying we shouldn't you know, put a gun to people's head and tell them to be Catholic. That is not true. Vatican II is defending exactly what Leo XIII is condemning in its, uh, in its declaration on religious liberty. Uh, it, it's just liberalism in action. And the, the principles that are put out in, in that document uh, can be traced right back to liberalism. Well, and the, His Holiness points out that there's actually even more, you could say, freedom, intellectual freedom to grow and to create when we when we're properly ordered he says this at the end of of the of paragraph 23 thus too license will gain what liberty loses for liberty will ever be more free and secure in proportion as license is kept in fuller restraint in regard however to all matter of opinion which god leaves to man's free discussion full liberty of thought and of speech is naturally within the right of everyone for such liberty never leads men to suppress the truth but often to discover it and make it known. And that's where we get wonderful inventions or new ways, uh, uh, great great symphonies, new ways of building churches, architecture, all of those things which we're free to explore because, as you say, we're finding different paths to Grandma's house that still has the right end in mind. Yes, and even higher things than that. I mean, the church has a certain set of teachings, but then other things it has not defined, and it has uh, it has left open to free discussion of theologians, philosophers. Uh, the church is, is not a, some oppressive regime that wants to control everything you think and say and do. It recognizes that certain things uh, are free to discuss, and and yes, uh, that it wants research on certain items uh, that that it might define something later, but it wants research now. And uh, for example, in the uh, case of the Immaculate Conception, the uh, definition, the, the the Dominicans were dead against the <laughs> Immaculate Conception, uh, the uh, because Saint Thomas said no, uh, and that's a whole other <laughs> we could do a whole show on that. But the uh, the Jesuits were totally in favor of it, and of course the Franciscans were in favor of it because of their great uh, theologian Don Scotus, uh, and his solution was being used for the explanation of it. And as I said, that's a whole other show. But there was controversy, and but uh, Pope Pius IX uh, established a commission of twenty theologians to study the case of the Immaculate Conception to see if it was a definable dogma. See, there you have legitimate discussion. I'm sure the Dominicans came in and said, we don't think it, it, it is. You know, and I, I, I was told this story. I, I don't know if it's true, but the, the, the Master General of the Dominicans, the night before the uh, definition said, tonight I do not believe. If he defines it tomorrow, I will believe. <laughs> well, <that's> so, a... <laughs> <laughs> he did not like the Dominicans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certain. <laughs> uh, the uh, Leo the Thirteenth, on the other hand, did and uh, recognized the the uh, the treasure of Thomism that the Dominicans had. So, but they believe <laughs> Dominicans knuckled under. Uh, but there is legitimate discussion of things uh, in the church, and there are many, many 
theological things which are discussed. Um, if you took a course in theology, you'd see a lot of things are, are openly discussed. And that's all open to free discussion. Uh, the Church does not uh, hinder anybody from doing that. Uh, and uh, the uh, and the, the Church will only condemn philosophical tenets if they contradict the faith, or scientific tenets if they contradict the faith. I mean, if you want to say that church, the moon is made of green cheese, the Church is completely indifferent. <laughs> it doesn't care. Uh, but if you said uh, something that contradicted the faith, then the, the Church will say something. Well, I, so, like, all, but, all of the uh, coming from gorillas and all that business. <laughs> but, but, but to be fair, Lee, if you if you said that the the moon was made out of green cheese, then as insofar as the church supports reason and 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 the intellect, it might it might say, well, we do we do have some evidence that it is not made out of green cheese. Uh, and for no, and, it, it would remain completely silent because it's not its domain to determine the nature of the moon. Hmm. Now. You know, a pope might think that's off the wall as he's thinking. You know, whoever says that it's a big hunk of green cheese is really crazy. Now, he might think that in his mind, but he will never say anything publicly about people who think that it's made of green cheese. Well, I, I suppose, you're actually, if it was a French pope, then it, it would, the matter would probably have to be settled. <laughs> uh, because, you know, there, I there, think there it would be a people... camembert. I think that would be the closest <laughs> thing to Now, that's more believable. <laughs> Now, His Holiness goes on in paragraph 34 to discuss something which I, I, Bishop Sanborn has on more than one occasion addressed, which is this idea of the super virtue of tolerance today. And His Holiness says, although in the extraordinary condition of these times, the Church usually acquiesces in certain modern liberties, not because she prefers them in themselves, but because she judges it, judges it expedient to permit them, she would in happier times exercise her own liberty, and by persuasion, exhortation, and entreaty would endeavor, as she is bound, to fulfill the duty assigned to her by God of providing for the eternal salvation of mankind. One thing, however, remains always true, that the liberty which is claimed for all to do all things is not, as we have often said, of itself desirable, inasmuch as it is contrary to reason that error and truth should have equal rights. And I'm thinking as I read this here, I can see in the United States, one of these things that I think His Holiness was foreseeing was maybe the paperwork you have to do in order to justify your nonprofit status, right? That in normal times, the church would just be given her own legal status standing and not have to deal with the IRS or any of that because it's the church. But today... There are certain things that you have to do in order to run a seminary, work visas, that you you have to do because that's what it is. But in normal times, the church would not have a preference for that. Uh, yeah, so what he's saying is that the, the principle which governs culture, uh, uh, social order, and government today, and he's talking in the 1880s, I think, here, uh, is something alien to the Catholic Church. So it's it's like somebody sitting in an atmosphere of poison gas, <laughs> or or at least stinking gas, you know. Uh, so how do we deal with this? The church has to go on. It has to, in some way, function uh, in this horrible atmosphere. Uh, for in order to uh, achieve greater good, it might have to tolerate some evil. Uh, I think that's what he's saying. That that you know this is this is not the ideal what we have and and. We just have to live with it as best we can without compromising anything essential, obviously. Uh, but then that that has been the case, you know. It's, uh, but I, you know, I would say in this country, though, I mean, because it operates consistently on the principle of indifference to religion, which is a horrible principle. But nonetheless, because it operates on that principle, it has become a, 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 an advantage to us in these times because the state really says nothing to us. Uh, I mean, yes, we have to fill out certain forms and we have to, you know, comply to, s to certain laws. But overall, the state really doesn't bother with us. A and uh, that, has, it, uh, for example, uh, you know, in certain states in which the Catholic Church is still to a certain extent established, like Italy, uh, if you are not a member of the Novus Ordo, you cannot be considered Catholic. 
so you cannot register as being Catholic, uh, and the state will not recognize you as the Catholic Church, because there is still a certain establishment, even though they believe in religious liberty and everything. They, they have a certain establishment of the Catholic Church. Uh, France, for example, is always interfering in, in the Catholic Church, even though they supposedly have a principle of indifference to religion. Uh, and uh, they they interfere in, in various other things. I mean, under the name well, of liberty, well, for example, <laughs> they they don't permit the Muslims to wear their their religious dress. And, and I'm no fan of uh, Muslims, but the I mean, if you're going to wave the flag of liberty to the whole world, why can't those people wear whatever they want? <laughs> well, to, to to be fair, Excellency, if your if your country has a history of kidnapping popes. Uh, they're going to be interfering all the time. <laughs> yes, but you know they 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 tout the, those European countries tout themselves as being you know the, the great libertarians and, and liberty, liberty, liberty. But they won't leave the church alone. They're they're always interfering, and and uh, you know they they even interfere with the Muslims. I mean, who cares if you want to come in a, in a saffron robe to school? Who cares in that <laughs> system? You know, if it's liberty, if you can do whatever you want, if that's if that's on they're your not money, even being liberty. Consistent with, they're not even being consistent with their lie No, they're not. They're not. They, they have nothing to say about religion. Nothing whatever at all to say about religion if they want to be consistent. And... Uh, uh, but they don't, they, you know, for them it's a cultural thing. Well, why is that a cultural thing? In 50 years, it won't be a cultural thing because France will be completely Muslim or, or certainly majority Muslim. And what, what will be offensive is, is a crucifix or, a, or, or a, a miraculous medal. That will be offensive. Or a nun walking in the street or, or a priest with his cassock. That will be offensive to the culture. Hmm. See, but again, you get back to that general will business, which is the ultimate infallible authority of all things. Yes, and, and His Holiness goes on in, in the encyclical to talk about different forms of government and protecting the church's rights, some things that we've talked about before and that we will talk about in future episodes. So I think we can, we can wrap up here, Your Excellency. We've covered, a lot of, we've covered a lot today. We've talked about the nature of liberty. We've talked about it, its, its relationship, how the church guards it, and its, its, its standing, you could say, in 1888. And as I say so often, it re- these, these encyclicals that we read, they read like they were written yesterday. And I think, too, for, for, those, for those listeners who are maybe for the first time entering into these encyclicals, they may be before this, this show and this program, they were never really encouraged to read. I think a consolation that I enjoy from having to host the show and, and working on this is I I I get to re remember the the office of papacy as that of the primary catechist. As I'm reading through this, I'm thinking, yes, the the man who's the Pope has to be maybe one of the best teachers, if not the best teacher of Catholicism on the planet. And as you're reading through some of these constructions and the way he phrases things, again, that that economy of, of verbiage, never saying too much, too little, just the right amount of, of, of words to describe what is necessary, it's just a treat. It's not easy to read it, but it is a, a real treat in order to to experience that and to know that that came from the Holy Father. Yes, it is a jewel. And I would urge people to sit down and read these and, and not read them casually. I would urge them to take a, a, like a highlighter and, and read every sentence and, and digest it. That's the way they should read it, because we are all infected by liberalism. And to de-liberalize yourself, you need to read this very, very carefully. Well, Yerkley, as always, thank you for... Uh, joining us for Popes Against the Modern Errors. We're going to get into Rerum Novarum in our next episode, which will definitely require two parts. So uh, we were able to, to put Libertas into one episode today, but um, again, if you want to prepare for these episodes, it will make sense for you to read the encyclical before, listen to the episode, and then again, reread the encyclical after if you've taken notes. If you really want to take this seriously, that's not just something casual, you can treat this 
program however you want. You can treat it as a class in which you're taking notes and going deeper. And as with any class, you can email questions to His Excellency, modern errors at truerestoration.org, and we can answer those follow-up questions on our next episode. For now, Your Excellency, thanks so much for your time, and, and we look forward to having you uh, on our next episode. Thank you very much. We want to remind our listeners that all of us here at the Restoration Radio Network would ask that if you found this show to be informative, helpful, or in any way beneficial to you and to your faith, that you please consider sending a note of thanks to the clergy who helped make our network worthwhile. Remember that above and beyond material contributions, the most important donation you can make to our work here is prayer. Please think of offering a Mass, a Rosary, or even a simple Ave for our work the next time that you pray. For the Restoration, I am Stephen Heiner. May God bless you. This program was brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novus Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovusOrdoWatch.org.